Breaking news in France. We're learning there was an explosion at a nuclear power plant this morning. This is a fast developing story. Here's what we know. This morning, an explosion in the engine room at a nuclear plant on France's northern coast sparked a fire, injuring at least five people at the plant. The fire is believed to have started by a fan which had a hardware malfunction in the engine room where the electricity is produced. Rescuers are at the scene assessing the damage right now. Officials have told ABC News that there is no risk of a radiation leak calling it a significant technical event, but not a nuclear incident because the fire took place outside the nuclear zone. Now, in really rather worrying news, a cleaning robot sent into Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant had to be pulled out from its mission due to technical glitches most likely caused by ultra-high radiation levels. Based on analysis of images from the robot-mounted cameras, the radiation reading inside the number two reactor at the number one nuclear plant was 650 sieverts an hour. During a similar probe late last month, Tokyo Electric Power Company estimated the radiation in the primary containment vessel to be 530 sieverts an hour. The robot entered the reactor on Thursday for the first time since the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami to inspect and clean a passage before further examinations. Despite the absolutely off the charts figures which can kill a person almost instantly, TEPCO officials insist radiation is not leaking outside of the utility. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump has agreed to honor the One China policy after his remarks questioning the longstanding policy escalated diplomatic tensions between them. According to the White House, Trump spoke with President Xi Jinping of China on the phone Thursday evening, U.S. local time. It was their first phone call since Trump's inauguration. Xi reportedly expressed his willingness to engage in mutual cooperative relations, and Trump was set to have acknowledged the importance of the U.S.-China relationship. The two leaders also invited each other to visit their respective countries. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has said that China appreciates U.S. President Donald Trump's upholding of the One China policy. Xi Jinping made the remarks in a phone conversation with Trump on Thursday. In the call, Xi Jinping said he believes that the United States and China are cooperative partners and that through joint efforts, relations between the two countries can be taken to historic new highs. President Putin has apologized for a Russian airstrike in northern Syria that accidentally hit Turkish positions, killing three soldiers. It is now confirmed that three Turkish military were accidentally killed in a Russian airstrike in northern Syria, near the town of Albab. It's two hour drive from Aleppo, the epicenter of recent fighting and the scene to perhaps the most severe clashes uh, in six years of war here in Syria. Much of that area is under the control of the Islamic State, so-called ISIS, and the Russian airstrikes were supposed to target their positions. But as uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin explained to his uh, Turkish counterpart, Prime Minister Recep Erdogan, uh, due to uh, miscommunication, uh, the positions of the Turkish army were hit instead. Vladimir Putin had a phone call uh, with uh, Recep Erdogan and uh, the two sides agreed to have closer cooperation in counting terrorism here uh, in Syria. We also know that Russia and Turkey agreed to have a joint investigation into this uh, deadly incident. Reuters reports that Russia views the deployment of NATO troops and military hardware to the Baltic states, Poland and Germany as a threat and has no information about how and when the buildup will end, the RIA news agency reported on Thursday. RIA cited Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Alexei Meshkov as saying Moscow was watching closely and would ensure that its own security was guaranteed. Meshkov's comments follow the United States deploying thousands of soldiers and heavy weaponry to Poland, the Baltic states, and southeastern Europe in its biggest buildup since the Cold War. German troops and armor are also due to reinforce Lithuania this month as part of NATO's plans, which are designed to reassure European countries after Russia's 2014 annexation of Ukraine's Crimea. 
Earlier on Thursday, Russia said it viewed Romania as a NATO outpost and as a threat due to its hosting elements of a U.S. anti-missile shield. Immediately after Donald Trump was elected, U.S. diplomats urged Lithuania to rush through an agreement to keep American troops on its soil. According to Reuters, the move reflected the alarm that the new, Russia-friendly U.S. president might try to stop more deployments in Europe. A document from the Lithuanian Defense Ministry shows agreement was signed just a few days before Trump's inauguration. It also became the first step toward locking the new U.S. president into a NATO strategy to deter Russia in Poland and the Baltics following Moscow's 2014 annexation of Crimea. According to the U.N. assistance mission in Afghanistan, the number of civilian casualties in that nation hit a record high last year. Yet the fighting between government and insurgent forces only intensifies. It is America's longest war. U.S. soldiers have been in Afghanistan for more than 15 years. That's five years longer than the Vietnam War. The 13,500 NATO and U.S. troops are helping the Afghan security forces, battling a resurgent Taliban. The NATO commanding officer believes Afghanistan is important strategically. Of the 98 groups designated as terrorists by the U.S., 20 are in this region. This is the highest concentration of terrorist groups anywhere in the world. And some of them are being sheltered and supported by neighboring Pakistan. Yes, sir. Sir, it's very difficult to succeed on the battlefield when your enemy enjoys external support and safe haven. The battle is far from over. On Tuesday, more than 20 people were killed in an attack in the Afghan capital. Daesh claimed responsibility. The group is operating in the country's east and is trying to recruit. Daesh is also believed to be linked to an attack on international Red Cross workers in northern Afghanistan on Wednesday. They killed six. The ICRC has been working in Afghanistan through decades of war. They have now suspended operations in the region. Nicholson says Russia is meddling in Afghanistan, trying to prop up the Taliban. Senators ask why Russia would get involved. Senator, I think their goal is to undermine the United States and NATO in Afghanistan. This week, President Trump vowed that U.S. forces would have everything they need. But he still hasn't spoken directly about Afghanistan. And it's unclear whether this White House intends to increase the number of troops. Britain has confirmed that it scrambled Typhoon jets to monitor two Russian blackjack bombers which flew near UK airspace. It's the latest example of Russian planes flying close to Britain. It's often a way of testing the response time of the military. France says it escorted the bombers along its coast. Wow! Wow! Rocket fire and gunfire in Israel's south and center areas. Five people injured. Overnight Wednesday in the resort town of Eilat in southern Israel, grad rockets fired from Egypt's Sinai desert. ISIL activists operating in the Sinai Desert claimed responsibility. Israel's Iron Dome defense system intercepted those rockets. ISIL said, or warned rather, this is not going to be the last time. This is also not the first time. And it's the reason that Egypt and Israel cooperate closely along the Sinai border. Going to Thursday afternoon, crowded market area in central Israel, a gunman opened fire, injuring five people. According to eyewitnesses at the scene, it was chaos. Civilians pursued the gunman who took off on foot. They captured him. Police eventually apprehended and arrested him. He was identified as a 19-year-old Palestinian from the West Bank. Israel's security apparatus is attempting to determine whether he operated alone or had an accomplice. Now, just hours before southern Israel was attacked, a mortar shell fired from Syria hit northern Israel, prompting the IDF to return fire at a Syrian army position in response. While Israeli military officials aren't offering details other than to confirm a direct hit in enemy territory, Syrian state media is reporting that Israeli helicopters were involved in the attack on its army base.
The sources are claiming that while there was some damage, no injuries were caused. Fortunately, no Israeli civilians were hurt either when the mortar hit the Jewish state side of the northern Golan Heights. The tank shell flew over the frontier in the midst of ongoing heavy clashes between Syrian government troops and opposition forces, in the demilitarized zone between the two countries. Regime soldiers were also reportedly shelling a nearby Syrian village with artillery at the time. Israel has repeatedly made it clear that the Syrian government will be held responsible for any spillover violence stemming from its bloody civil war. Meanwhile, Israeli military officials are denying Hamas claims that the Jewish state carried out an airstrike early this morning in the southern Gaza Strip. Two Palestinians were reportedly killed and five others injured in some sort of an incident there, but Israel says it had nothing to do with it. Brazilian media have reported looting, carjacking, and mugging in municipalities abandoned by the police officers. Looting in broad daylight on the streets of Vitoria in Brazil. There's been little security here since Saturday when the state's military police went on strike. Their friends and family are blocking access to barracks. There hasn't been any salary increases for seven years. A military police officer receives $800 to support his family. But after days of violence, the public mood has shifted against the strikers. The Civil Police Officers Union says dozens of people have been murdered. Schools and some hospitals have closed, while shops have been ransacked. My friends and colleagues all had break-ins. Here at the shop, we had to pay private security. Most shop owners closed up because otherwise they would have been looted. The guard worked here in this street until 3 a.m., exchanging gunfire. Yesterday in this street from 2 a.m., they got around 15 people trying to break in. On Tuesday, 200 federal police officers were deployed in the southeastern state. Around a thousand soldiers are also being mobilized. Yet the governor of the region says that's not enough and he wants more backup. A new battle over judges is brewing after President Trump criticized American courts again. It comes as the Ninth Circuit Appeals Court considers his travel ban on seven countries with a history of terrorism. I don't ever want to call a court biased, so I won't call it biased. And we haven't had a decision yet. But courts seem to be so political. Meanwhile, a new poll from Politico shows the public approves of Trump's halt on immigration. 55% approve of the order, while only 38% disapprove. On Thursday, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against President Trump's request to reinstate the travel ban. The ruling will likely give Republican lawmakers more momentum for something they've tried to do for years, break the court into two. The Ninth Circuit covers one in five Americans. The average turnaround time exceeds 15 months. And now, if excessive delays weren't bad enough, it turns out that the Ninth Circuit is overturned by the Supreme Court 77% of the time when the Supreme Court grants cert. Arizona Senators Jeff Flake and John McCain reintroduced the legislation last week. A similar piece of legislation was introduced in the House by Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs in January. As the Wall Street Journal pointed out earlier this month, people have been trying to split the court for over 70 years due to its size and its reputation for liberal rulings. A 1998 report from a commission formed to look at restructuring federal courts of appeals recommended against splitting the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Republicans now control both houses of Congress and the White House, so the legislation could have a better chance at advancing. The world's largest refugee camp won't be forced to shut down after all. Kenya's highest court has blocked a government plan to close the Dadaab refugee camp because the move was ruled discriminatory and unconstitutional. Last year, the Kenyan government issued an order to dissolve the United Nations-run camp. The closure would have forced more than 200,000 Somali refugees to return to their war-torn country. 
The government argued keeping Dadaab up and running was a security issue. Specifically, it claims extremist group Al-Shabaab has been using the camp as a base to recruit new members and plan attacks on Kenyan soil. But human rights groups said closing the camp would put a quarter of a million refugees at risk of human rights abuses. The Kenyan government has yet to respond to the ruling. China will start taking the fingerprints of foreign nationals crossing its borders. The Ministry of Public Security announced the new rules in a statement on Thursday, February 9th. The fingerprinting reportedly aims to boost border control and immigration measures and improve efficiency. The rule will apply to all foreign passport holders ages 14 to 70, but those with diplomatic passports and visas are reportedly exempt from being fingerprinted. Countries like the U.S., Japan, and France have similar requirements. China will run a pilot test of the program at Shenzhen Airport starting Friday and gradually implement the process at other entry points nationwide. China's smog problem isn't getting better, but covering tall buildings and plants is one way to try to fix it. By the time the buildings are finished next year, they'll be home to 1,100 trees and 2,500 other plants. The company behind the project estimates all those plants will soak in 25 tons of carbon dioxide a year and release 60 kilograms of oxygen daily. Similar vertical forests exist in other cities. And while that sounds like enough to make somewhat of a dent, some environmentalists have mentioned that new construction creates a lot of carbon dioxide. And later on, the plants will need upkeep and water. According to a recent report, 40% of the world's smallest pollinators, like butterflies and bees, are at great risk of extinction. In response to this alarming situation, scientists are looking into the idea of creating an army of miniature drones to fill the gap. So far, the technology is very basic, with each drone having to be controlled manually. However, tests so far have shown the promise of success, and researchers say that eventually the drones could one day learn to fly on their own, using GPS and artificial intelligence. While this may prove a measure that could help the pollination situation, it still doesn't account for the bee's ability to manufacture honey, another vital ecology contribution of the bee. Rescuers have been racing to save pilot whales in New Zealand's Golden Bay. It's been one of the country's largest recorded strandings, with 300 whales dead. Volunteers have been trying to send more than a hundred more back out to sea. We're hoping for the water to come up. Oh, it's amazing! And there are people from all over the world. Anyone who's within Kui um, has heard about this. They've just uh, um, come over. We brought three hitchhikers over who just said they wanted to come here and do whatever they could. More heavy rain in Northern California. In the town of Orenda, a hillside rolled into a home. In Fresno County yesterday, a man and his car were fished out of a creek. Here's the silver lining. A year ago, much of the state was severely dry, but now only about 11% is in severe drought and less than 1%, that area there in red, is extreme. Good morning. There are concerns. New South Wales could be hit with rolling blackouts today as a three-day heatwave begins. Sydney signers will head to the beach and crank the air conditioning to escape temperatures in the high 30s and early 40s. Many have struggled to cope, with dozens taken to hospital and surgeries cancelled. In two of our theatres, we couldn't proceed due to the humidity problems. Last night was another hot one, staying in the high 20s for most of the evening. Residents braced for more power outages. 90,000 homes were cut off on Wednesday night due to high demand, 40 plus heat and a lack of wind generation. Politics over the blackouts are hitting boiling point. Last night, quite frankly, was avoidable and should have been avoided. And of course they want to blame it on everybody else. Well, I suppose they could blame it on the wind because it wasn't blowing yesterday. This is an issue about competence. Authorities have also issued blackout warnings for residents in New South Wales. The next three days in Sydney are going to be the hottest three days on record for Western Sydney, with temperatures likely to be getting up around 42 to 45 degrees every single day. The electricity failure, a national problem. We can't afford to go the way South Australia has which has the most expensive and the least reliable electricity in Australia. Bad for jobs, bad for business, bad for families. So we've got a lot to do. It's a complex issue. Let's get to work. 
Today in the Northeast, a blizzard howled in from the West. 50 million people were in its path. Some got up to a foot and a half of snow. Well, people here have been in the thick of this blizzard most of the day with heavy snow and high winds not only whipping up those waves, but leaving many people here without power. Vehicles large and small were slipping and sliding the break, the break, the break. on the snow-covered roads in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It's pure ice underneath the snow, snow on top of ice. Wind gusts estimated at 65 miles per hour knocked out power to streetlights and 1,200 homes. Have you been out today? Yes. Plymouth Fire Chief Ed Bradley drove through town to see how residents were coping in blizzard conditions. Conditions, And hopefully that everybody would stay off the road. Eventually the conditions would get so bad you won't be able to see a couple feet in front of the vehicle. It'll just be complete whiteout. Rob McClellan lost power temporarily and worried about his 13-month-old baby, Connor. So we've got some, some gas, you know, let's get the gas down. If we have to, we can get the generator going, but at least we've got some heat now for our son. The state's emergency management agency said more than 55,000 Massachusetts homes and businesses lost power during the day. Along the coast, six-foot waves battered homes. In South Boston, where some 12 inches of snow fell, schools and some government offices closed. And in New York City, at least nine inches of snow fell. Scott, due to this blizzard, schools in Boston will be closed again for a second day tomorrow.